Hey, what's up, guys? It's Dan. Welcome to the show. So, a couple of months ago, while surfing the interwebs, I stumbled over a video by YouTube's anti-feminist Mesopotamian emperor titled TYT vs. the Nazi Menace. This video came out shortly after the news broke that the Trump administration was separating children from their parents at the border, and the progressive news network TYT did a little piece on it, pointing out how practices like these combined with the extremely hostile rhetoric of the Trump administration are reminiscent of the Nazis' rhetoric and practices. Now don't worry, we're not gonna watch Carl's full response, since it's mostly pretty self-defeating stuff, but I'll show some clips to sum up Carl's contention with comparisons like these. The link to the video is in the description so you can listen to everything in context. It's strange as a foreigner watching American media, watching the descent into absolute lunacy from the left-wing media, the, the side of politics that doesn't generally give a shit about the family unit, all of a sudden is really, really bothered that kids are being separated from their parents at the border. Oh, won't somebody think of the children? Attorney General Jeff Sessions is frustrated that so many critics are comparing the zero tolerance policy of separating children from their parents who then get prosecuted for misdemeanors uh, to Nazis. <laughs> well, I wonder why that is, Anna. I wonder if it's because it's a completely irrational comparison. And I wonder if it's, in fact, devaluing the term Nazi. I mean, the Nazis weren't just people who enforced their own borders. There was actually a lot more to the Nazi party and their philosophy than that. If you can believe it, Anna. It's almost like calling people who are keeping your borders secure Nazis just because they believe in borders. And, oh, who else believed in borders? That's right fucking Nazis, it doesn't make them the same. You lunatics. You absolute fucking how- Okay, I think you get the idea. And now quite recently he did another video reiterating that opinion when it comes to comparing the US detention facilities to concentration camps. Now before we move on, I should tell you why this video comes out now and not earlier. After stumbling upon the first video, I thought to myself that this would be a great opportunity to talk about the validity of Nazi comparisons and if I think those hold any water with respect to the current Trump administration. And there are numerous reasons why I had to scrap several attempts and was almost not going to do a video like this at all. The first one being that talking about the rise of the Third Reich and especially the Holocaust in this way is much different from trying to explain other historical events like why the First Crusade happened for instance. These topics bring with it a tremendous amount of responsibility and for me as a layman to attempt to explain these very socially weighted and complex events really implies a great deal of arrogance on my part. And while I always try to frame my videos as my opinion at the time or points to be considered, I can't negate that what it boils down to is the appearance of a lecture. Another even bigger reason as to portray Germany's descent into Nazism as a cautionary tale it's somewhat necessary to explore how people thought at the time, shifts in their moral axioms and inner justifications for their crimes. In doing so, it's very easy for me to come off as wanting to humanize the Nazis and I want to make it extra clear that it's not my goal to shift responsibility or excuse any of their actions. But sometimes it's necessary to take an analytical approach to show how we are no different from the people living in Germany before the Nazis seized power and even after. With that said, given the current conversation about what a concentration camp is, my two cents might be interesting to some of you, but I need to reiterate that I'm only able to provide a very narrow view on the discussed subjects, since I'm neither an expert on the Third Reich nor a social psychologist. So please take this as what it is. Last disclaimer would be that this is not a response video, per se. With Carl Benjamin, I just have the luxury of having all kinds of terrible right-wing arguments or attitudes condensed into one or two videos. His points just serve as a jump-off point for us to talk about a broader subject, so there isn't going to be a lot of debunking today. Now with that disclaimer out of the way, let's talk about concentration camps, and after a bout of comparing the current US to Nazi Germany holds any water. It's easy to see why a congresswoman calling the US detention facilities concentration camps would cause such an intense debate in the US, considering that the education system focuses so much on concentration camps in the context of Nazi Germany. And naturally, if that's what you associate with the term concentration camp, you would say, no, this comparison doesn't make sense. And let's watch a short clip of what I was just talking about. And then Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez stomps on in with a socialist, socialist Gucci boots and is just like, oh my God, the fact that you keep 
these illegal immigrants on the border while they're being processed in what we will call detention facilities, which I think is most accurate, they're concentration camps. Alexandria, my dear, these are not concentration camps. Concentration camps are not something that people try to get into. They want to get there. They're trying to get to those concentration camps, which makes them the opposite of what actual concentration camps are. You know, the, the actual concentration camps are actually a way of killing people, Alexandria. They're a way of genociding people or turning them to work serfs, which, again, is not what the detention centers are doing. They're actually saving lives. It's actually the total opposite point. While these people can be processed, no, you know, let in or sent home, whatever. But obviously Vox, I'm a Jewish historian. Yes, we should call border detention centers concentration camps. It isn't just accurate, it's necessary. No, it's wild hyperbole. There is not going to be a genocide of Native Amer uh, Central Americans under Donald Trump. This is not a way of killing them off. This is a way of keeping them safe while we figure out what's going on with them. I say we, while the, 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 the border, uh, border agents and whoever is involved with it figure out what to do in line with the law and the process. Usually now would be the time to go over this point by point, showcasing reports about awful conditions and preventable deaths in these camps, allegations of forced labor and sexual assault including minors, maybe some footage that would contradict how awesome it is to be there and interviews with people on the ground saying how desperate they are to leave. But with this one, we're going to try something else. Let's try a hypothetical and stick with me on this one, I will promise this will make sense. Imagine there is a country somewhere, and this hypothetical country is currently facing a large influx of asylum seekers or immigrants for whatever reason. These newly arriving people don't speak the same language and are from a part of the world that is seen as fundamentally different than the country they're trying to get into. As always, the usual social tensions arise and the typical debates are being had about how to handle the situation, and the political right of this country calls for swift deportation and denying these people asylum, saying we can't take in the whole world, etc. You know how this goes. The debate goes back and forth and the usual articles are being published showcasing each side of the argument. Here's how one of these might look like. The increasing immigration of this new group of people is gradually becoming a serious problem. Although one may be far from wanting to deny these unfortunate ones the right to asylum, it must not be forgotten that a large proportion of these arrivals are made up of people whose immigration and settlement in our country meets justified concerns. Pity for them must not blind us to the fact that they are largely unfit for integration into our society. Naturally, there are also voices in the press arguing for the opposite, and opinion pieces like this are also published. In the public, increasing voices can be heard that demand legal measures against the newly arriving asylum seekers. These people are deemed black marketeers, smugglers and criminals or as work shy. All these arguments are aimed at taking the strongest measures, i.e. to cram them into concentration camps or force them to leave the country. A measure that destroys so many livelihoods should not be based on bold allegations. Even less it should be based on demagogic agitation that doesn't live up to the facts nor is capable to effectively remedy existing damage. Truly, the recovery of our country cannot be brought about by the use of force against a small, defenseless fraction of the population. Eventually, the authorities respond to increasing right-wing pressure and set up facilities to concentrate asylum seekers and immigrants without citizenship to ensure swift deportation. Shortly after they are set up, though, reports of unsanitary conditions and inhumane treatment spark public protest, and a female politician decides to tour some of these facilities to get a picture of the situation. The conditions she witnesses in these camps are absolutely appalling to her, and in front of parliament she claims that detainees are forced into wooden barracks, infested with bugs, and that the air in these buildings is unbearable. At night they only have sliced up blankets to protect themselves from the cold, and she also talks about the detainees being served substandard food, including rotten potatoes. Continuing, she says, It's not just our responsibility, but the one of every upstanding person to bring this shame to an end as fast as possible. And closes her report with categorizing the previous occurrences as severely damaging to the reputation of our country. A different public figure also decides to tour these facilities and comes to the opposite conclusion, stating, All in all, we can say that this whole thing has been blown out of proportion and is used for political agitation by the left. Okay, enough of this. What was this all about? Well, I just thought it would be funny showing a number of events from a different time and place, considering how much it echoes the current situation in the United States, without you knowing where this happened. But enough of the funniness, here comes the gut punch. As you can probably already guess, our hypothetical country is not hypothetical at all. 
It's very real and this all happened in the early 1920s in the country of Germany. I had to switch a few words for the quotes like replacing Germany with our country, but the rest is all kept the way it was. The news piece opposing the asylum seekers was published in the Karlsruher Tageblatt on the 3rd of January 1920, and the opposition piece was written by Albert Einstein a couple of months later. The female politician touring these camps was Mathilde Wurm of the Independent Social Democratic Party, and the quote about the concentration camps being totally fine and used as a political tool by the left also is a real quote. Now, why does this even matter? Apart from being one of the more interesting historical parallels, it matters because the immigrants in this case were Jews, fleeing persecution in the Russian Empire and seeking refuge in Germany. It also matters because these were the first camps on German soil to literally be called Konzentrationslager. Not that it should matter since facilities with the name Concentration Camp have been around since the Spanish-American War, and if you don't know the difference between what a concentration camp and what a death camp is, maybe just, you know, shut your face about it. So yes, these are concentration camps. Anyway, the reason why I like this German example so much is because in retrospect, we can clearly see it as being a stepping stone to the eventual genocide of the European Jews by Nazi Germany and its collaborators about two decades later. And not just Jews, of course, but other minorities like Romani who were also stuffed into the same earlier described concentration camps in the 1920s. And keep in mind that when Germany's first domestic concentration camps were set up, the country had a left-leaning government which openly condemned anti-Semitism. The Nazi party barely even existed at this point and was far from entering the national parliament. So now would be the time to write your comment about how the US concentration camps already existed under Obama to totally own me or whatever. About two to three years after being established, Germany's first domestic concentration camps would close their doors again because the conditions continued to spark public protests and operating them became too much of a fiscal burden for the government. Be that as it may, the arguments from the right when it comes to human rights abuses in the name of immigration enforcement don't change over time, it seems. If these camps are so horrible, why don't they just stay where they are? This is just a political ploy by the open borders left, etc. And I can only speculate what these people feel on the inside, but the smug scoffing when someone brings up past atrocities to say, you know, maybe we're going down a dark path and cramming vulnerable minorities into a confined space and then neglecting them, comes from a total inability to see societal violence on a continuum. Before we jump into that though, I couldn't resist to point out at least one thing in the video we used as a jump off point for this topic. Near the end, our narrator shares an article written by Paul Joseph Watson which suggests recently resurfaced photos of AOC at a facility for minors are staged and taken at an empty parking lot because there are no children visible like two feet away from the fence or something? Now of course, because it's Paul Joseph Watson, it's a bunch of nonsense and Snope has since debunked the article and verified that the photos were indeed taken at the Tornillo tent city, which housed 2,900 miners before it was shut down in January due to safety and health risks. It wouldn't be a Sargon of Akkad video without a conspiracy theory, I guess. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Besides the ones I already listed, the main reason about showing a parallel between 1920s Germany and 2019 America is to hammer home the fact that large outbursts of violence against minorities should be understood as the end of a process with lots of steps preceding it. When it comes to collective acts of violence, they are not unexplainable sudden eruptions but recurring social processes with a start, a midsection and an end. Not being able to understand how these events unfold is laid bare in the responses to Nazi comparisons and what it seems to boil down to is, why are you invoking the Nazis? It's not like the US puts people into gas chambers. I can't even really blame people for setting the bar as high as committing an actual genocide because it's really hard to imagine a modern democratic country sliding into what looks like a collective race insanity as in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. It's hard for me too. And it was hard to understand for the people immediately after the fall of the Third Reich as well. How could a modern country that brought forth so many advances in culture, science and equality just 180 like that in such a short amount of time? It's not like Germany was an exceptionally anti-Semitic country compared to the rest of Europe. A historian once speculated on what would happen if a time traveler from 1945 arrived back in Europe just before the First World War and told an intelligent and well-informed contemporary that within 30 years a European nation would make a systematic attempt to kill all the Jews of Europe and exterminate nearly 6 million in the process. If the time traveler invited the contemporary to guess which nation it would be, the chances were that he would have pointed to France, where the Dreyfus affair had recently led to a massive outbreak of virulent popular anti-Semitism. Or it might be Russia, where the Tsarist Black Hundreds had been massacring large numbers of Jews in the wake of the failed revolution of 1905. That Germany, with its highly acculturated Jewish community and its comparative lack of overt or violent political anti-Semitism, would be the nation to launch this exterminatory campaign would hardly have occurred to him. 
This question of what happened in Germany was one of the many things people hoped to be answered by the Nuremberg trials. You know, let's just ask the higher-ups of the Nazi regime or at least analyze them. After all, some of the main perpetrators like Hermann Göring were in the hands of the Allies and pretty much the entire Western world was curious how they justified their actions. These were the guys who had planned and executed one of the most horrible crimes in human history and cultivated all these ideas about subhumanity and the destruction of Bolshevism and the struggle between the Aryan and the Jewish race. Really some insane stuff to an outsider. And learning about the scale of their crimes led many people at the time to conclude that these people must have lost their minds and that there wasn't much of humanity left in them. The court psychologist at Nuremberg was a guy named Douglas Kelly and he conducted pretty detailed psychological tests with these main perpetrators. One test he promised himself conclusive results from was the Rorschach test. You know, showing someone an abstract ink blot and then interpreting their answer. They're not used as much anymore, but at the time they were seen as extremely reliable. So, he conducted the tests and sent the results to leading Rorschach experts to get an idea of the perpetrator personality, for lack of a better word. Now, for a psychologist of any prestige, really, this must have been a dream assignment. Everyone wanted to know what was up with these guys, and to get a shot at being the one who deciphers the personality of the Nazi leadership, who could say no to that? Surprisingly, all of them could. Not one of the ten experts responded to Kelly's inquiry to isolate distinct character traits from these tests. There were some excuses, but it really didn't make sense that all 10 psychologists would pass on this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. About 30 years after this, a colleague of Douglas Kelly gave away the real reason nobody responded to their request, and it's not because they didn't even look at the material that they were given. They all did, most likely. But they also knew that the world was expecting them to find a common personality structure of the very worst kind, and the material simply didn't offer that. You can ask yourself if you wanted to be the guy to be handed the material for someone like... Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe, head of the four-year plan, and then respond with, well, to me, this guy looks pretty normal, actually. Only Kelly himself had the guts to write in his closing statement, from our findings, we must not only conclude that such persons are neither sick nor unusual, but also that we could find them today in every other country on Earth. That's kind of unsettling, isn't it? Not something you would want to hear from someone psychoanalyzing some of the worst criminals in human history. Now, you might say, well, these people were just pushing papers around and having meetings. It's not like they were the ones pulling the trigger. Sadly, we seemingly can't find any refuge in that explanation either, because in 1980, two guys named George Krenn and Leon Rappaport took a look at the psychology of members of the SS, the grunts of the Nazi regime, so to say, and concluded that the vast majority of the leadership and their subordinates would have passed the psychological tests of the US Army or Kansas City Police with ease. They put the number of outright psychopaths in the SS at 10% at best, which really isn't that high, all things considered. Another example that caused perplexity among a lot of people was the evaluation of Adolf Eichmann, often described as the architect of the Holocaust when he was put on trial in the early 1960s. One of the consultants evaluating him claimed that Eichmann was by all accounts normal and added, at least more normal than I am, after examining him. A bit after that, a different clinical psychologist by the name of Molly Harrower dug up the material Kelly had gathered at Nuremberg and decided to give it another try. She mixed the material of Göring and the others with a couple of unremarkable profiles and sent them to a bunch of experts, but this time they didn't know who the people they should analyze were. She also asked them to take a guess of what these people did in their day-to-day -day lives. And at least this time the majority responded, but no one even came close to guessing what kind of material they had been given, with the speculations ranging from civil rights advocates to the material being taken from psychologists themselves. Pretty mind-boggling stuff. On a somewhat unrelated note, four of the five top Nazi officials who were able to avoid the death sentence at Nuremberg all saw a chameleon in one of the Rorschach pictures. Not going to do anything with that fact, I just thought it was interesting. Anyway, it's not only that the vast majority of people in the Nazi regime or the ones committing crime in its name were psychologically speaking normal people, even the worst of the worst didn't even feel bad about their actions afterwards, and that's even scarier if you ask me. And most of these people went on to live relatively normal lives afterwards, working as bakers or police officers and didn't, or don't, because some of them are still alive to this day, suffer from insomnia, depression or anxiety. Contrary to their victims, by the way, who suffer basically their entire lives if they manage to survive. And here's where we get into the stuff that's really hard to process, so if you feel like rather not hearing some of these people try to remove themselves from their responsibility, maybe skip the next part. When we look at how the perpetrators talk about what they did, it becomes very clear that they have a self-image that would baffle anyone who is confronted with a list of all their atrocities. 
Take this quote, for example. Let the public continue to regard me as a bloodthirsty beast, the cruel sadist and the mass murderer, for the masses could never imagine the commandant of Auschwitz in any other light. They could never understand that he, too, had a heart, and that he was not evil. As the quote already gives away, this was written by the commander of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, in his biography, responsible for over a million deaths and probably one of the most evil people in history, but even he doesn't see himself as a bad person. It's baffling, really, and leaves one kind of hopeless about human nature, at least it does me when reading quotes like this. Here's another horrific but sadly not unusual example of this attitude. I made the effort, and it was possible for me, to shoot only children. It so happened that the mothers led the children by the hand. My neighbor then shot the mother, and I shot the child that belonged to her, because I reasoned with myself that, after all, without its mother, the child could not live any longer. It was supposed to be, so to speak, soothing for my conscience to release children unable to live without their mothers. This was said by a police officer sent to Poland and the real weight of the statement kind of gets lost in translation because the German word that he used here translated as release also means redeem or saved when used in a religious sense. And this quote really jumped back into my mind when I read an article about a former ICE spokesperson who tried to garner sympathy for the deportation goons in saying... These are parents themselves. I know people aren't sympathetic to deportation officers, but they have a rough time with this too, and I think more so under this administration. Although I should explain the similarities here. Nazi propaganda never framed the act of killing the people they deemed subhuman as an act that you should enjoy or feel good doing. They only framed it as necessary. And here's where the real dynamic of societal violence comes into play. The earlier quote from the police officer saying he did his best to only shoot children is set in the context of him trying to appear as a good upstanding person. He is living completely outside our moral axioms. This is what racist propaganda does to a society. Being able to commit acts of cruelty, be it killing someone or stuffing them into a concentration camp, becomes an act of virtue and the perpetrator is framed as acting righteous because he is able to overcome his or her own doubts and still do what they are told is necessary. Now I get this might all sound very abstract and it's hard to imagine oneself going through that process, so I'll give you an analogy that really helped me understand it. Imagine someone offering you money to hurt another person with a sharp knife, maybe unintentionally killing them in the process. It's not someone you know, but I think it's safe to say that most of us would not take that deal. But if you apply a different frame of reference, it turns the entire thing on its head. For the example just given, think of yourself not as a random person, but as a surgeon who is supposed to perform an operation. That kind of changes everything. And the whole thought process now active in your mind of... Well, of course, cutting people open is wrong, but it's done for a good cause. It's not like the surgeon enjoys what he's doing, but the end result counts, etc. Is what the Nazis and other murderous regimes utilize to make their foot soldiers commit atrocities. And you don't even have to be a die-hard anti-Semite for the societal process to change your perception. This police officer was part of a conscripted police battalion who were too old to been through Nazi socialization, or the brainwashing. They also hadn't been desensitized by war, and they all came from the city of Hamburg, which was and still is one of Germany's most left-leaning cities. On top of that, the members of this police battalion were explicitly given the choice to not take part in the killing of innocent people by their superior. But still, the vast majority of them still did it. I didn't come up with that surgeon analogy myself, though. It's from social psychologist Harald Welzer, who wrote a book with the very straightforward title How Normal People Become Mass Murderers, which I can't recommend enough. The last question that's still unanswered is how does a society even get to that place where its frame of reference becomes that twisted? At the beginning, there's always some sort of grouping taking place, so a subset of the population is defined as something else, and then a categorization is filled with meaning. Typically, that's because of racism, but that's rarely enough, and just because a racist is elected into office doesn't mean there's a genocide down the line. Although, of course, it emboldens those attitudes and gives people who are already racist more self-confidence because there is less of a social stigma around calling Mexicans rapists if the president has already done it, for instance. Anyway, for large acts of violence to occur, it always requires a bunch of people to be either apathetic or provide cover for what is happening. And how one becomes that person is arguably even more important than the type of person we talked about before. Now, another analogy. Imagine it's the first day of a new school year. Before the teacher comes in, the school bully shows up and singles out one of your new classmates and briefly makes fun of him. Let's say that happens every day for a couple of weeks and gets more intense over time. Now, of course, you could say something, but you know, you're happy that you're not the one being singled out. You don't want any attention directed towards you and nobody else says something, so why should you? Kind of sucks for that one kid, but you know, who doesn't experience something like that in school? You tell yourself. 
Now the year goes on and year one classmate is increasingly bullied until at the last day of school, the bully comes in, punching your classmate in the face. You and the other classmates are now way less likely to report this to a teacher than you were at the beginning of the year. And that is because we tend to rationalize decisions we made with some sort of ambivalence after the fact to fit it to our own self-image. Therefore, subconsciously, it often appears easier to reaffirm a previous decision by repeating it rather than questioning it and thus admitting that all your previous decisions might have also been wrong. This is how actions that were previously unthinkable become possible over a very short amount of time. The job of something like Fox News or YouTube's rationals in this analogy is to play the role of the guy who, if somebody does say, hey, this kid is getting bullied, I fear he might receive some physical abuse if we don't do something, to respond with, this is ridiculous, I can't believe you would smear the school bully like that, and in fact, I consider this deeply offensive to all the victims of physical abuse around the world. The just described process is also why so many people seem to disregard their stated principles like free speech or anti-corruption when it comes to someone like Trump, because they'd rather be a hypocrite than admitting that they were wrong. It starts with, you know, Trump is an idiot, but I really dislike Hillary, so yeah. Then, I'm a Trump supporter not because of specific policies, but because he makes the left so mad, until you find yourself saying stuff like, as long as children in concentration camps are not screaming at the top of their lungs, I don't see much of a reason to be concerned. Nobody on the right side of history thought this was the answer to a flawed policy. I'll tell you what, Francis, a child's whiny cry would have a lot more traction with me if I wasn't a parent, but I'm afraid at this point I have become inured to the whiny cries of children because children give that kind of whiny cry all the time. Can't have a biscuit, whiny cry. Doesn't want to go to bed, whiny cry. Doesn't want, can't find its favourite toy, whiny cry. I'll tell you what, Francis, I'm actually really relieved that that's the kind of cry that you exposed me to, because if it had been a high-pitched, sustained cry of fear and pain, then I would have been like, yeah, okay, something's really wrong. Historians like Richard Evans, who wrote the Third Reich trilogy, which is fantastic, typically don't start their analysis with Hitler's first electoral victories, but go back as far as Bismarck. They talk about the spreading of scientific racism in the 1890s, or local anti-Semitic politicians pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable in political discourse. First you stretch what is acceptable to say, then you push what is acceptable to do. The discrimination of Jewish refugees in Weimar, laws like prohibiting Jews from owning dogs under the Nazis, these are just as much part of the genocidal process as is pulling the trigger years down the line. This is why Nazi comparisons are not only valid, but necessary. An example apart from immigration where I would consider this perfectly valid would be the attack on trans people by the Trump administration. Removing them from their jobs if they serve in the military. Rolling back protections against housing discrimination. There are countless examples of this administration going out of its way to harm this community. And a lack of pushback against government action like this will only lead to more severe actions down the line as it did in Germany and so many other places. The sheer horror of what fascism looked like in the past can be blinding for the emergence of fascism and radical nationalism in new forms. Of course, when hearing the word fascism, we think of the mass party, brown shirts marching through the streets and people throwing the Hitler salute. But just because that is missing, we shouldn't be tricked into thinking the far right has adapted and accepted the idea of minority rights and democracy. In an earlier version of this script, I had a couple of lines here saying that it didn't take much for the German right to pivot from it's just those Jewish refugees we don't want in the country to actually it's all Jews and we shouldn't accept the American right to have any qualms about something similar either. But reality outpaced this script and that pivot has already happened in parts. Typically, I like to end a video in summarizing the point of all my previous rambling in one or two sentences, but this time... I'll have to tag in historian Timothy Snyder, who summarized these points better than I ever could, so I'm just going to use what he said. To forbid analogies makes the Holocaust irrelevant to future generations. If an American child can identify with Anne Frank, an American child might ask what it's like for immigrant children to be separate from their parents. To forbid analogies is to forbid learning and to forbid emphasizing. That, sadly, is the point. Thank you for watching everyone. Another feel-good video from me. My apologies, but that script was driving me nuts, so I just had to get it out. I'm glad I even have the opportunity to release this video because, as some of you already know, this entire channel was temporarily removed from YouTube a couple of weeks ago for some reason. 
I assume it got caught up in some kind of automated process, which is to be expected given the subject matter of some of my videos. Shout out to all the very nice people making some noise on my behalf when that happened, because I'm not sure the channel would have been reinstated without your help. Be that as it may, now I'm back, and I promise next time I'll do something more lighthearted. This whole channel being deleted affair really made me appreciate my patrons a lot more than I already do, because despite demonetization or videos being deleted slash locked in certain countries, I don't rely on YouTube to keep this afloat because it's crowdfunded by some of you guys. Big thank you for that, and I'm definitely going to record a commentary track for this one because there's still a bunch of stuff I had to cut that might be interesting to some of you. If you want to see that video, the link to Patreon is in the description. This video is really just a long-winded way of saying people are shaped by their surroundings, but to me that always seemed very abstract and I could never imagine myself being shaped in that way. As always, I encourage you to check out the source material in the description. And that was it for today. I hope to see you the next time. Until then, have a good one.